Will, thank you so much for being on the Wealthy Podcast. Welcome. Oh my goodness. Thanks. This has been a long time coming. I'm glad that we're talking now. I know. I know it has been. I've been wanting to meet you for, it feels like a year or two at this point. And yeah. luckily it just worked out that we could at least meet virtually today, if even if yes. we couldn't meet yes. um, in person right now, but I'm sure we will at some point. So I'm so excited to have you. There aren't enough functional medicine practitioners and doctors out there doing your work and not only helping patients, but also being very present online and sharing a lot of great content um, for people that don't have the pleasure or can't see you um, mm -hmm. to also get benefit from your expertise. Oh, thank so, you. That's what we're going to do today. Um, I'd love for you to um, share a little bit of knowledge on supplements and vitamins with my audience. Mm -hmm. It's a very hot topic in medicine in general. I think people have really polarizing views on mm -hmm. whether to take them at all, what mm -hmm. kinds, how much, for how yeah. long. Mm -hmm. So first things first, just because I don't like to jump right in without knowing a little bit about you or having my audience know a little bit about you. How did you get into functional medicine? The origin of my interest in health and wellness began when I was a little kid. I was a weird kid. I, I, did, I grew up in a home that was interested in wellness. So I didn't, it was interesting because it, it, we're talking about the 80s and 90s in the countryside outside of uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and definitely not the, the, the mecca of, of wellness. It wasn't Abbott Kinney or you know Soho in New York. It was definitely uh, still what it is today, a lot of fast food chain restaurants. Uh, but I was the weird kid drinking adaptogenic tonics and raw this and organic that and sprouted this. And at uh, a time when it probably wasn't that normal for anywhere because the wellness industry wasn't what it is today. I mean, now when you go to Expo West in Anaheim every year, it's massive, thousands of people in the health food industry. Um, so that was my childhood. And then that evolved to me knowing I wanted to do it, be formally trained in that. So I went to Southern California University of Health Sciences in Los Angeles, which is an integrative medicine school. There's doctors of chiropractic, MDs, DCs, LACs, DOs, naturopaths, nurse practitioners, all there kind of learning their craft or training doctors, other doctors there. Um, so that's where I, I went to school and I heard of a guy called Tatis Karazian who had gone to my school and he was older than I was. And uh, he was talking about this field of healthcare called functional medicine. And that's actually, even today, Tatis Karazian is one of the leading like, well, godfathers, if you will, of functional medicine. He speaks for the Institute for Functional Medicine, IFM, who's trained me and my team. And now, all these years later, um, my day job is getting the opportunity to consult people around the world uh, via webcam. Like to, the space of telehealth and telemedicine has really grown. But when we started this 11, 12 years ago, we really were the only one of the only doctor, functional medicine practitioner clinics running uh, webcam consultations. But now it's more common. Um, so that's how I got into it. And I have autoimmune conditions on both sides of my family and I myself have a double gene allele uh, for, at the MTHFR gene, which is the gene that makes the enzyme that converts folic acid into folate, which we can talk about because it has to do with vitamins and supplements too. But um, basically, it means that my body's not that good at methylating in one specific way and not good at bringing this form of inflammation level down called homocysteine. Uh, and it's associated with different autoimmune conditions, things like Hashimoto's disease, autoimmune thyroiditis. Uh, have a high, has a high strong connection to the MTHFR gene allele, autism spectrum disorders has a higher, and other autoimmune conditions too. I mean, I've on one side of the family we have Hashimoto's, both sides of the family have Hashimoto's thyroid problems, and we have type one diabetes on both sides of the family. I have MS type symptoms on both sides of the family. It's a really strong family history of that. So I wanted on a personal level. A, to help them, but B, what can I do to mitigate the risk factors, to do everything I can? I can't control everything. Nobody, none of us can control everything. But what can we do today to, to decrease risk factors and to be healthy? And to, because we know that a third of that autoimmune puzzle is genetics, but it's only a third. Two thirds is epigenetics. It's the, the things that we do in life that are constantly and dynamically instructing genetic expression and turning off and turning on gene expression. So the foods we're eating or not eating, our stress levels, our sleep, our exposure to toxins, 
all of these things are influencing genetic expression. So that's also on a personal level was the impetus for me to, to immerse myself in functional medicine as well. But now it's so cool because I can implement these principles and tools and, and protocols into people around the world's life. So that's, that's my um, journey in a nutshell in this space. Yeah, I was a little bit of a weird kid too. <laughs> I had a mother interested in a lot of this stuff. So um, yeah. through her own health experiences like you, I think she had a lot of illness and knew that and so was trying to do things. And then I was, of course, sick with Lyme when I was a mm. kid, which I've talked about on this. So some people might, listening might know that, but part of that was getting a real close-up introduction to the health food world and the you know integrative practitioner yeah. world. And I'm sure when you were a kid, they just called it wheat free, right? Not gluten free. We never yeah. talked about gluten. No, yeah, you're right. Wheat free. The wheat only free other non dairy milk was like rice stream. You remember <laughs> yes. that? Yes. Oh my goodness. This we amazing we ate those carob chip cookies because you couldn't have <laughs> chocolate. Those are brutal. So funny. Um, and I don't know if you remember this. Oh, what was that called? It was like this jar, this huge bottle. Uh, the name is eluding uh, me now, but basically it was like this bottle of mud water. It was so strong, but it's funny. My wife, I've been married since I was 21. So we basically been married for a long time, 14, 15 years at this point. But basically she had the same experiences growing up in Los Angeles with the same sort of type of mom and parent. And we have the same random eighties and nineties references to like health foods that were like, remember this, remember that. Cause it was like, no, there weren't that many options of stuff back then. No, no, it's yeah. improved so much. It's kind of wild to think what we called bread before, like the, <laughs> the you know, all the frozen bread. I mean, it's still frozen, yeah. but it was so bad. Yeah, blocks um, of just dense. Oh yeah, and to try to bread. get it on, you know, try to get a piece oh, off from that, was, you would yeah. routinely cut yourself. Yes, and you like, would cut your finger on bread. Yeah, you would <laughs> try to like pry it apart with a knife. Yeah, I still yeah. have a scar from doing that actually. <laughs> Um, I got five stitches here. Oh um, my gosh. Fry apart gluten free bread with a oh boy. The, the, knife. The pain that we went through. Right, exactly. It's very funny to commiserate on being yeah. a child and being like, Mom, no one's going to play with me. I'm not eating <laughs> this food. Another way that she tortured me when I was a kid was a crazy amount of supplements. And mm -hmm. so I think my audience might find this topic pretty interesting and has asked different questions of me about it. And not being a practitioner myself, I can advocate for being a licensed patient, patient advocate. I can advocate that they do different things as far as, you know, get a blood test, see a functional medicine doctor, practitioner who can actually tell you if you have micronutrient deficiencies and what kind of supplements you might need. But sometimes people are just like, I'm not going to go through all of that. I know everybody says I need to take some vitamin D. It's December. If you're not going to tell me what to get, I'm just going to go to the store and get it myself. So mm -hmm. there's a little bit of that. So I try to like hedge and say, I think it's important to see a practitioner and then also just have some basic like things to look out for when yeah. you know trying to figure it out. So first, do we really need to take supplements at all? And if so, why? And isn't it supposed to really just come from our food? Yeah, I don't necessarily think everybody needs to be on supplements. And I, I think that's a need is I'm taking that word very literally there. You can't supplement your way out of a poor diet. You cannot like think that taking that pill, like, like that herbal pill or that vitamin, whatever is going to somehow undo an unhealthy un nutrient less diet so you have to to me i see supplements or natural medicines herbal botanical like uh options for people i see them as targeted tools to fill in the gaps where diet isn't hitting a therapeutic threshold the component to the conversation is soil depletion and food therefore food uh, nutrient density has decreased. So yes, I think we have to be more intentional than ever before to make sure that your food medicine, your breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and snacks are the best options that you have with the access you have the, within your budget to uh, do the best you can there. So I, I do think that meals should be your primary medicine. Um, so I start there. Um, but because our food supply isn't what it once was, and we are not getting as much out of our food as we did for the majority of human history. There is a place for targeted supplementation or target, targeted natural medicines. So 
it depends on where your baseline is too. So it depends on where, what is the context of whoever we're talking about. Because some people, and this is bio-individuality, this is the heart of functional medicine, what works for one person or what's needed for one person, even if it's healthy, may not be needed or wanted for the next person. So it's definitely important to understand like who we're talking about as well. Because some people have a very strong uh, resilience and a metabolic fortitude where they don't need a lot to get by and they're going to be healthy. They feel all right. Their labs look all right. They're not really uh, suffering, right? Um, and at that point, if they're eating clean foods, then they're obviously, there's not a great need to supplement. Uh, maybe vitamin D, depending on where they live in relation to the, to the equator, but even that, I think some people can get by and live a long, healthy life if they have this sort of large, you know, if we use the analogy of like a, a mug, like a tea mug or a coffee mug, they have a large mug to stressors in life. And they're not going to overflow very easily. They're going to get by on life. They're going to eat rather, rather clean uh, and be all right. Some people have smaller mugs, so to speak. They have smaller genetic thresholds to stressors. Uh, and they are going to overflow pretty easily. And their body has specific genetic SNPs, genetic variants, or an uh, un unhealthy gut, which isn't absorbing foods as readily, uh, where supplementation is going to uh, allow the person to reach a therapeutic threshold that's going to serve them well. Because we aren't just what we eat, we are what we absorb. And if people are not either converting nutrients appropriately from foods, meaning the bioavailability of certain nutrients from our foods, or their gut's not healthy and they're not absorbing, absorbing foods to actually assimilate it and utilize it on a molecular level, then supplementation makes more sense for those people. In the day and age that we live at today, that's higher than ever before. When you look at the amount of gut issues, the amount of inflammatory issues, which inhibits absorption in, on a cellular level and a microbiome level, and these genetic SNPs, which have been around for 10,000 years, but are being triggered like never before because of the onslaught of, of stress and toxins and all this stuff, there's an argument for supplementation now more than ever because of these variables, but it should be secondary to food in my opinion. So besides a blood test, are there ways that people can tell if they are vitamin or nutrient deficient? Like I'm sure someone listening to that's like, I don't really have gut symptoms how do I know how big my mug is kind of? Yeah, right. So that's a good question. So I would, and this is honestly why I started my second book, The Inflammation Spectrum with a quiz. So people, the quiz is just adapted from questions that I ask patients because it's more than just digestion. So I really want people to kind of go through the areas of the inflammation spectrum, sort of the areas of how inflammation or imbalance in the body can impact their life. So we look at the brain, we look at the gut, we look at detoxification symptoms, we look at hormone systems, we look at autoimmunity. So all the ways that people can see signs and symptoms that people see in their life, looking at things like energy, looking at things like digestion, look at things like hair and skin and nails, looking at their mood and their mental health. How are these things in their life? Something that I say a lot, which is very, it's because it's true. It's just because something's common doesn't necessarily mean it's normal. Just because you, you're going through things every day and you settle for it doesn't necessarily mean it's actually something you should settle for or even normal for human health. So I find a lot of people are really living this sort of low-grade inflammatory problems that are manifesting in the form of these issues that I'm talking about, whether that's digestion or mental health or hormone health or weight loss resistance, hair problems, skin problems, nail problems, that are signs that the body isn't where it should be. Uh, so I would say check in with yourself, whether that's just doing a good old-fashioned quiz and just that's adapted from functional medicine or health history principles, or it's getting a functional medicine practitioner or doctor in your life or running labs on your own. There's a lot of direct-to-consumer labs that people can run, basic tests that can, they can run. And we run those labs for people too, but you don't need a doctor for some of these basic tests. Um, so I would say to, to check in with yourself, both subjectively and objectively, meaning how are you feeling subjectively and objectively, maybe running some basic tests. Don't be obsessive with labs. Just run the most relevant labs, depending on what you're going through. Run the most appropriate labs. and. Um, get a baseline. What are you up against? Are you feeling the way you want to feel? And what can you do about it? Um, and in most cases, people can do quite a bit about how they feel and how they look and th their quality of life and th their overall health and longevity. So um, 
those are some things to think about. But labs are a good way to, to do it. So we can run some inflammation markers to look like things like high sensitivity C-reactive protein in functional medicine. We want it under one. Homocysteine is another inflammatory marker. We want it under seven. Um, that has to do with methylation, which you need for healthy hormones and detox pathways. And uh, ferritin is another easy lab for people to run, a low cost lab. We want uh, ferritin, which is a biomarker to gauge for stored iron, but it's also uh, considered an acute phase reactant. So basically in states of inflammation, ferritin can spike. And then you can run good basic uh, blood sugar markers too, like where's your glucose? Where's your A1C, which is the three month average of your blood sugar? or your HDL and LDL, your cholesterol markers, where's triglycerides, and looking at the optimal ranges, which is different than the lab's reference ranges. So you wanna look at where your body's actually optimized, which the lab's reference range is largely based on the average of population of the population of that lab. So it's not looking at optimal health. So in functional medicine, we're looking at optimal ranges. If people wanna know those, they're in the book, they're also, we have them online for free too. You can just go to drwillcole.com for people to see the optimal ranges of where these numbers should be. So yeah, those are some things to think about. You kind of see where you're, where you're at. And as nutrients specifically, you can run methylfolate, methylcobalamin, methylmalonic acid. You can look at B vitamins very easily on blood. You can run vitamin D very easily on blood. You can run zinc and magnesium very easily on blood. Uh, you can look at a lot of these markers very easily on blood tests. Again, most of these are low cost, simple tests. Doesn't mean they're necessarily always the best tests for them, but they're good snapshots of time to see more or less like where are you at on this sort of uh, inflammation spectrum, so to speak, or where are you at as far as your baseline. Uh, and then there's more advanced labs you could run. You could run gut tests, kind of see the absor absorption and digestion and see if your body's having trouble breaking down carbohydrates or proteins or fats. And if there is intestinal permeability or gut centric inflammation. And then there's labs like uh, SpectraCell that measure intracellular nutrients to vitamin A and D and zinc and all these things that we're, we're measuring too. There's definitely more comprehensive labs, but not everybody needs those. So some basic labs too, you can uh, run as well a lot we can do on the on the figuring out if we do have deficiencies right there. Mm -hmm. um, do you recommend against people just shopping for their own supplements without a blood test first? Or do you feel like that's okay if they think they might just need a few common vitamins? Yeah, I think that's completely fine. So it depends on what they're up against. It depends on what they're going through. I mean, most of my patients, by the time they meet and have a, we have a consult together online, they've gone through a lot on their own. They've had to be their own health advocates. They are very well read. They have immersed themselves in the space because they've had to, because many times their doctor just is like, ah, basically doesn't give them any direction on that. And that's largely a training problem we could, we could probably get into, but they're, they're having to figure these things out on their own. And they've gotten to a certain degree, they've gotten in a better place on their own uh, invariably. And that's, a good thing. I mean, that's taking, you know, agency over your wellness and they're way better off than if they weren't doing all the good things that they're doing, in, including taking supplements um, and their foods, obviously. But they're looking to see what's missing from their health puzzle from me and saying, how do we take this to the next level? Because despite their good efforts and doing all these good things, they're still not where they want to be. They have, they tend to have the smaller mug, so to speak, but they can't get away with all the things that other people can get away with, but they're still struggling. And they're looking to see what's missing from that puzzle. And then we can do that. But they have started that race on their own. So I love when people are informed and are looking into this and finding the best things. And I think conversations like this are really helping people to get, get direction on that because it can be overwhelming. I mean, Dr. Google is a very fickle physician. He's vegan and he's yeah. paleo yeah. and he's, he's carnivore and vegan. Yeah, he's oh. all of the things. Yeah. yeah, he will say one will kill you and then the next day the other one will kill you. So it's, it's uh, very disillusioning. Uh, I understand that. So to cut through the confusion of people that actually do this for a living and see labs improve and see quality of lives improve, it's definitely important in this very loud uh, confusing world that we live in. So if people are taking supplements, do you have thoughts about how much is too much or, you know, sort of vitamin or supplement fatigue? Because, you know, mm -hmm. having gone through health issues in my own life and now working in the wellness space, I've had that myself, right? Where I've, I've just taken so many for so long that I yeah. kind of boycott 
and yeah. go through a couple months where I can't even look at another supplement because I'm going to, you know, yeah. throw up from the idea of it. And then you do see certain doctors and I've, you know, read so many books um, who are functional medicine doctors mm-hmm. who, you know, the back of their book, I mean, it's, it's, it seems like hundreds of supplements that yeah. we could be or should be taking for, for different things. You mentioned Hashimoto's or um, mm-hmm. different gut problems here and there. So I sort of see the long list and get, Mm -hmm. I'm sure like a lot of people fatigued already at the idea of all of those. And you're not quite sure, you know, if there's five or six things that could help, let's say Mm -hmm. menstrual cramps or could help, you know, with gut permeability, which one is the best of those? Or should you kind of be taking all of them if you think that's an issue for you and you know, we're bringing up the good points because you've lived through this. <laughs> yeah, that's, things that's in truth. my own life. But the reality is you're not alone. I mean, this is like a very, very, I hear it on an almost hourly basis. So we call that the supplement graveyard because there's like this mass drawer or like cupboard of like what uh, you have like a zillion different kinds and you like stop taking ones and it can be sort of for lack of better words, like schizophrenic in a way where you're like, what's working? What's not working? Am I taking the right dosage? Is this the right brand? And this right, it, it is, it's, it's, it's a lot. It's a lot to take in. Part of my job, because again, most of my patients have gone through this journey. They're very well read. They're doing, taking a lot of stuff is simplifying all of that. And like when I'm taking a health history, I'm like, okay, one of the questions I ask is, okay, do you feel like like, okay, any one of these specifically are helping, or is it hard to tell because you're taking all this cocktail of different herbs and stuff? Sometimes you'll get answers like, well, yeah, I know this, this, and this are helping me, but the rest, I don't know if it is or not. I'm just taking it because it, I read that it was good, or I you know, was told to take it, or whatever reason. So I typically start with the ones that they've seen anecdotally in their life. When I stopped taking that, I didn't feel as good. When I run out of it, I don't feel as good. Or when I take it, I, it definitely moves the needle in a powerful way. So we have a starting point of like some game changers in their life. And then we typically lead into labs and kind of seeing what's even needed. Because there are, like you talk about dosages, there are definitely people that are overdosing, not in the, the drug sort of sense, but they're taking higher doses than they should, uh, where you measure on a lab and it's like through the roof. Or you have people, and this is oftentimes the case, they're not dosing high enough because they're taking just the suggested dosage on the bottle and it's not making a dent in where they're at as far as the deficit they started at. So they're like doing the well-intentioned thing and taking this thing every day, religious, one to two capsules a day. You're running the lab and it's like, whoa, like that is definitely not making a dent in where you're at. That doesn't necessarily mean that nutrients not right for you or not working. It's just not the therapeutic dosage that you need to move the needle in a way that's meaningful, that's quantifiable on a lab. So that those are definitely detailed, nuanced conversations that you have with every single person that you're talking to. So I do feel like it's good to have someone outside of yourself, if it's possible for you, to kind of point you in the right direction and make this as practical and realistic and efficient as possible. When you talk about dosages, uh, it's like water-soluble vitamins, like B vitamins, typically you're going to pee them out. So you can get a toxicity level with those, but it's less likely. Normally, you're just going to be peeing out like bright yellow uh, or like neon uh, colors because your body's excreting a lot of that out, and uh, it's just a byproduct of that. Fat-soluble vitamins like vitamin A and vitamin D and K2 – those are stored in the fat, so they can you can get to, to levels that aren't great. Most Americans are not at high levels of that, and the problem is typically not enough levels. Um, but you can definitely see toxic levels of vitamin A, D, K2, uh, E, vitamin E, because of the fat-soluble uh, nature of them. Um, and that's not to scare people away from taking them. People need to be taking these type of nutrients if they are deficient in them, or people should consider at least getting those nutrients from foods, I should say as well. Um, because fat soluble vitamins are definitely master regulators of the immune system and hormone health and brain health. They should be getting them from foods. And if appropriate, they should be getting them from supplements as well. Uh, and the American modern American diet is really deficient in these fat soluble vitamins. And same with herbs too. I think that there's, there's not a way to gauge herbal toxicity levels or herbal deficiency levels because these are just modulators of human biochemistry. So for example, adaptogens or herbs or botanicals that help to modulate cortisol levels or thyroid hormone levels or stress, you know, just 
inflammation levels at large or the brain hormonal axis. People are taking those up more and more like because of the popularization of them. So things like ashwagandha and rhodiola and the adaptogenic mushrooms and tulsi, holy basil, they are popularized. So people tend to be taking them. They, I see people sometimes taking too much and sometimes people not taking it not enough to see the changes that they're looking to see. And then that adds to the supplement graveyard because they think, what the heck, I'm just going to stop it now. And there's a half filled bottle, a half empty bottle of some random herb. I want people to take things that are effective. I want take people to take things that are most relevant to them. Those are the, the things that keep me up at night. <laughs> <laughs> and do you think people with the smaller mugs, as you call it, should be taking things indefinitely? Because I've sort of always grappled with the, you mentioned the therapeutic dose. So basically, for anyone who doesn't know what that means, you know, it's basically if you're trying to heal something, you're doing something therapeutic. So um, having a certain amount of vitamins, um, maybe if you're trying to reverse Hashimoto's, for example, might be necessary. But then it's sort of like, do I need to keep taking it to keep that at bay or so mm -hmm. sort of indefinitely, or is this really just for a certain amount of time? And then I'm expected to be able to live, mm -hmm. you know, without it or just get these nutrients from my diet. So there's different classes that I, I, I consider like intellectually, I just put the, the ones that are we're using for a time to target these issues that we found on labs, or you just see in a health history and, or just if someone doesn't have a doctor, they just see in their life, they're targeting these things to fix a sort, certain thing. Things in that category would be like things like uh, to support gut health, like L-glutamine, or um, things to keep inflammation, like if someone has higher inflammation levels, like turmeric or resveratrol or terastilbene to help lower inflammation levels. Or even adaptogens, I could probably, for some people, put it if they're going through a real stressful time in life, like cortisols are really low, really high, using adaptogens to help modulate that. Uh, those would be oftentimes for a time or for a season and they're like uh, just like uh, they're not necessarily like a maintenance thing forever and ever amen the other category are things that i would consider more core for most humans uh based off of where they're at so for example if someone has a double gene allele a, a SNP, which stands for single nucleotide polymorphism. These are gene variants that you get from your mom and your dad. Let's say they have a double gene allele for VDR gene, which is the vitamin D receptor gene, or they have a double gene allele for the MTHFR, which means their body doesn't uh, activate folate very well. So if they live in New York, uh, which is not like the, it's not Miami or like not tropical year round, and they have a double gene allele to v vitamin D receptor that they're probably going to want to supplement with vitamin D and K2 on a maintenance dosage forever. Or if they have a double MTHFR, they're probably going to have take some level of methylfolate, maybe methylcobalamin, B, like B vitamin, methylated B vitamins forever because it's basically overcompensating for what the body's not doing as well or you're not getting enough through food or you're not getting it enough uh, on your own that you want to basically give your body more of what it needs to mitigate deficiencies or any risk factor that's associated with those numbers being off. Um, so those are some things to think about. But I actually think for most human beings, that list of things that should be maintenance isn't very big. It's not a massive supplement graveyard list of things. It's, it's normally like a good quality omega fish oil or an algae oil to get the long chain omegas if you were completely vegan, which is a bigger conversation. Um, but then a good methylated B vitamin. I would say those are kind of the, the core, core things. I think, I, I think from some people you could say a probiotic would be a part of that core stuff, but it's really not that much stuff. I mean, if some people want to get a multi-mineral, things like that, but I think food can fill in a lot of the stuff the targeted stuff are based on the case history, like what you need or what you're going through uh, and then used for a time. When you see bright yellow pee, <laughs> mm -hmm. does this mean that you're taking low quality supplements? We'll get into quality of supplements um, in a second. Or does it just mean that you're taking too many supplements or something about 
you is incapable of absorbing all of it or what does it really mean? There's probably a lot of reasons why you would see a change in your urine. I mean, when you talk anything, you're taking higher doses of something, you're not getting through food, you're going to see an excretion uh, and it could change the color or even the smell uh, of someone's urine. It's definitely not to say that the supplement isn't high quality. Uh, it, it just means that there's either some modulation of detox pathways where the body's kind of get, clearing things out, whether that's because of the vitamins themselves or from the vitamins themselves. So water-soluble vitamins tend to do that. It's not necessarily a bad thing. You Typically, people are getting a lot of B vitamins. If you look at the percentage of the daily value, they're getting a lot more because they are water soluble and your body is getting rid of a lot of them. So the bioavailability of them isn't as great. The body's not storing those vitamins like a fat soluble vitamin like A, D and K2 and E. The body stores them, keeps them. Vitamins B and C are water soluble. The body's not storing a large amount of them. So you're gonna see the shift of the, of the urine oftentimes with those. So generally speaking, it's just from water soluble vitamins, I would say more than anything, B and C mostly B vitamins. And it's not a bad thing. It's just going to be uh, something that you notice. That makes sense, actually, because I haven't been taking very much vitamin C lately, just because I'm trying to simplify and minimize as you were yeah. talking about. But I used to take quite a bit, a couple thousand a day. Um, and I'm remembering feeling like I had more of that bright yellow kind of yeah. vitamin urine right. that you're talking about when I was taking that. So that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, but it freaks some people out. It's like, what the heck is this right? Am I dying? Yeah, well, I, I bring it up because I remember, you know, an uncle at a holiday meal doesn't take, you know, supplements saying to me, oh, I tried all that stuff. It's just really mm -hmm. expensive, bright yellow pee. Yeah. And I stopped yeah. because I thought, oh, it's just coming out. It's not actually doing anything. I'm just kind of wasting my money. And I thought that was a really interesting perspective. And it made me think, oh, I wonder if a lot of people who are not necessarily aware of everything that you're talking about, but try supplements here and there and don't really mm -hmm. know what they need or why and aren't you know careful with the dosages, mm -hmm. start to see this and think, because they're not cheap, as you know, mm -hmm. um, oh, well, if it's just coming out, I'm not really absorbing it. I shouldn't yeah. really at end of story and don't yeah. ever really come back to the I, whole idea of supplements or, or mm -hmm. herbal therapies. So I thought that was just something helpful to kind of clear up. Like, what does that mean? It's interesting because you can see the bright yellow pee uh, and you, you'll you think it's not doing anything for you, but then you measure something like homocysteine. It's an inflammatory marker. The body has to recycle that down into methionine and basically bringing that form of inflammation, homocysteine, down you, one of the ways you do that is foods primarily, and then uh, supplementation of B methylated B vitamins like methylfolate and B2 methylcobalamin. You're gonna most people, even if they're dosing lower doses of methylfolate and methylcobalamin, are gonna see a change in their urine, and then you think, okay, you're just peeing it out. But I see for years and years and years, and there's just no denying that that's how you recycle homocysteine down. Uh, you'll still see that number come down. And that's a good thing. That decreases cardiovascular risk factors. It decreases neuroinflammation, brain inflammation. It's really good for to lower that for autoimmune problems too. So it's, it's one of those things where that's not a sign that things aren't working. It's just a sign that maybe you are, maybe you can cut down the dosage of it because you are peeing a lot of it out, but it isn't, it's not all or nothing. You just have to kind of tweak it a bit. Got it. So now I want to ask you about supplement quality. So is there a difference between like a CVS brand vitamin C and what you might see in your health food store, as well as what a functional medicine doctor like yourself could possibly prescribe? Because I think those are all three different qualities or grades, as I think it's called. So could you yeah. just explain a little bit of that? This is where Dr. Google, it's really, really a uh schizophrenic in a way. He's really uh, very confused, very, very uh, fickle. The problem is there's so much, so many good products on the market, right? I mean, because of you have this burgeoning industry of well, health and wellness, that's a lot of good thing. You have a lot of people that are very interested in this, entrepreneurial people, people that want to get good quality products out into the world. That's a fantastic thing, but it can be overwhelming for the consumer. So what I would recommend, and read the labels, just like you're doing when you're buying a product, hopefully any other product, you want to read the labels. So for yourself, like vet the back label of it, look for any added or f added fillers. If it looks like a chemistry lab and the fillers, 
I'm not saying not to take it, but just to really educate yourself and really look into what each one of those ingredients does and if the dosage is, is appropriate or not. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure that people got that there was differences between quality grades. So yeah. like, for example, you are able to order what oh, yeah. is called, you know, like pharmaceutical grade um, yeah. supplements, whereas like a normal person can go- walk into a store and only buy what's called, I think, consumer grade yeah, um, or over the counter or store-bought mm-hmm. grade. So there are quality differences between those. And I just wondered if you certainly, could Oh yes, absolutely. This. So we do, we do pharmaceutical grade, uh, natural medicines, what I call them or supplementation. You can only get them through a licensed practitioner, whether you are in functional medicine or your conventional doctor, not that they would give you vitamins there, but they could in theory, get it to you. Uh, but that's definitely true. And it, what those companies do where we get them from the third party tested they exceed standards there's no like added fillers or binders or strange ingredients like these are like top of the line like labs that we go to in this space um and it it keeps the quality up it keeps the um appropriate management of these issues together uh and the integrity is intact so it that is lost to some degree when you get to direct to consumer, it's, it's, it doesn't mean that it, it's bad. It just means you have a lot more noise to cut through um, because it's not as vetted and regulated and targeted. So you have to really do your research if it's direct to consumer. That's the nice thing. If you do have access to a functional medicine practitioner to sort of uh, fine tune it a bit, so you're not like overwhelmed with the mass amount of options. And are there third party rating apps or websites or certifications that someone could just go to if they actually wanted to look up a couple different brands they were considering buying? There isn't. There's not going to be where you could get an app or a website that I know of where it's centralized. I've not seen that to, to my knowledge. I think there are definitely certain compounds in certain supplements that you'll see certified in certain ways, but I don't see it aggregated in a way that it's a one-stop shop. They can just find it all. That would be nice. Maybe you're onto something there. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, small plug for my program. That's kind of what we've been doing with a couple um, different direct-to-consumer supplement brands and the pharmaceutical brands too, because it's very hard to find any kind of third-party rating, but mm-hmm. that's a big part of the program I'm running in yeah. January is doing that with personal care products and I love that. home cleaning products and kind of making it very simple. Like we've already looked at all the third-party rating things and here's a couple that we like. So there's eight modules of my program and the healthcare and natural medicine one, I've been really working on it the last couple of weeks and scouring the internet for you know, the ability to see this in a third party way, because otherwise you're just relying on marketing and I don't, yeah. that's not good enough for me. Um, yeah. And so anyway, yes, there's, there's an Very opportunity true. for somebody to, to do that. But like you said, there's so many tens of thousands of products that it would be, yeah. it would be hard to get going. So give it all of that. What you're um, advising is that if you're not working with a functional medicine doctor who can give you these pharmaceutical grade vitamins and natural medicines, then you need to just be an informed consumer and make sure that you're mm-hmm. reading labels the same way that you would if you were buying a granola mm-hmm. bar, right? Hopefully yeah. you are um, on any supplement or any kind of herb or tincture that you might get. And yeah. then really trying to make sure that there's less of those hyper chemical sounding ingredients, mm-hmm. right? Um, and less of things like maybe citric acid or these like fillers and gums mm-hmm. and things yeah. that you know, you just don't want to have in anything, um, Mm -hmm. supplements included. Right. Um, and then what else would you advise when people are trying to decide, you know, kind of dip their toe in and start to do some of this themselves before they, um, Mm -hmm. work with a practitioner? Some other considerations, I would say, get a reputable source like we just talked about and then start low and slow as far as dosages, but then titrate up where it's appropriate. I think some people do are like overly ambitious and they just want to take a high dosage of things like adaptogens or things like, uh, you know, maybe some other herbal protocol and that, or even CBD is a good uh, topic on that. You, you typically want to start off low and slow. And if you want to get super geeky, you can also phase in supplements too. I think that that is a little arduous if you're taking a lot of stuff, but I think that 
like n equals one like sort of experiment for yourself anecdotally is to kind of see like how do you feel on certain things so give it some time so you could phase in some certain things especially if you're sensitive you do have a smaller bunk or genetic sensitivity to these sort of things uh i would say phasing in supplements is oftentimes something that i do lead patients through so that you can kind of see are you having a reaction to any one of these things I don't want to over dramatize it. For most of the population, they're not going to have reactions to these things. These things are very safe. We're talking about vitamins and supplements and herbs. I don't. Want, it's not that big serious for. for yeah, most I was going to say I've been taking supplements a long time. I can't really think of a time where they've affected me negatively. Yeah, not, not even that, or enough for me to really notice. Like, oh, that's working for me. I'm like right, but sensitive people, which I tend to spend a lot of my time with <laughs> consulting them, that can be a little thing where you, they will have GI symptoms from certain things, or they will have anxiety from certain things. And they, oh, their systems are a little bit more overreactive. So I realize that don't talk to the average person all the time. Let's say you are supplementing with vitamin D, or you are supplementing with an adaptogen. Consider getting a baseline. Like seeing where your vitamin D is, seeing where your cortisol levels are at, seeing where your thyroid hormones levels are at. If you're bringing things, taking things for inflammation, see where your inflammation levels are at. Running HSCRP, C-reactive protein, running homocysteine, running these benchmarks to kind of see, are you getting to where you want to be goal-wise or are you overdosing? Or are you not dosing enough? All that things. These are, again, most of these are low lower cost labs. You don't have to be excessive with this stuff. They get benchmarks of stuff. And we run those labs for people around the world. And again, there's many, if you want to do it on your own, there's some direct to consumer stuff too out there. Last thing that you um, mentioned that I wanted to bring up was about Amazon, buying supplements on Amazon. Yeah. So have you heard that there are some issues with people selling stuff that's actually not like, you know, filling capsules yeah. with baby powder mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So there are precautions to take, right? And with buying supplements on Amazon, or do you advise people that they shouldn't buy them on Amazon? Or what, what, how should they make sure they're not getting weird stuff? Yeah, definitely. And I think that some other uh, concerns that people have is the storage of the in the warehouses of Amazon as far as temperature control, if they're in like a hot area, and if there's things that can be oxidized readily. Uh, easily. Um, it's the, the factory should be temperature controlled. So yeah, that is a concern for me. Um, and obviously, if you're not buying from a reputable source, like you don't want capsules full of baby powder, that would not be good. Um, but if that's the going back to like vetting the looking at the ratings, looking at the brand and understanding the quality that's there, making sure you're buying from the brand itself that is highly rated, not a third party seller that somehow is selling you expired supplements, which I have also heard of. Um, where it's way past the sale date and they're just selling you past things. That is the nice thing of like getting it from a functional medicine practitioner because these are all, at least the ones that we are providing, we are um, making sure that they're fresh because these things can lower their effectiveness the longer they're sitting on the shelf. For example, if you have a blend of different herbs, the effectiveness of that supplement is only good as the oldest supplement that's in there, meaning that you, if let's say the, it's a blend of adaptogens and you have an ashwagandha and rhodiola and holy basil, the ashwagandha is older, but holy basil and rhodiola are newer, what's the expiration date? So they just generally give you like very general manufactured dates. Manufactured dates, if you see MFT or manufactured date on the bottle, it's just telling you when it's all put together. It's not telling you exactly how uh, old or how new all the blends of the different herbs or micronutrients that are in there. So what we do um, with the labs that we work with are looking at the actual expiration date based on the oldest thing that's in whatever capsule you're taking. So you know you're getting the most bioavailable, usable, effective dose of the thing you're taking. Now, look, does that mean that everybody needs to be up people and never buy anything on Amazon. That's not what I'm saying. But if someone's really dealing with a health problem, they're trying to improve and spending their money on it, they want to make sure that it's most effective. So not everybody has to go to that length, great length. They're going to get more good things and bad things if they go buy a reputable source on Amazon. But sometimes people need a little bit next level like sourcing of things, especially if they've tried for a long time at this and they're not getting where they want to be. So those are some things to consider. Well, I feel like this has been a lot of great information and advice on this topic, which 
is a very, very confusing schizophrenic topic, as you mentioned. Um, and the problem, I think, with a lot of it is that people want to sell you things. Mm. And there are brilliant marketers out there. Mm. And so, like you said, you know, if it was just the people doing their really good work of creating really high quality products that have for years, that'd be one thing, but there's just a very, very little regulation and all these brilliant other marketers whose products aren't very clean, but aren't necessarily mm -hmm. terrible for you either. Right. Just throwing buzzwords like cruelty free and mm -hmm. vegan and this and that. And you're sort of like, okay, that sounds like a good thing, but that says yeah. absolutely nothing about the quality of this yeah. product that, or bioavailability yeah. or like you said, or yeah. how they do temperature control and all of that. So yeah. um, I think now people will have a better sense of how they might attack this issue um, if they are buying their own supplements um, and also just understanding how much you really need to be taking and the pro of simplifying rather than just throwing the kitchen sink in there because yeah. technically everything can help you until mm -hmm. you get so fatigued by the whole process that you take none which is what's happened to me a few times yeah. so better to keep consistent with a few things that you really should be taking mm -hmm. all the time than take all these things that could potentially have some kind of benefit to you but basically tank your ability to keep up with your yes. regimen and then you know you got to start all over again well said for sure <laughs> awesome well thank you so much again my very last question which i ask everybody that is on the wellby podcast or the wellby show is about how you hashtag get wellby so that's our social channels and our website and so basically this is your can't miss wellness routine like if you have the craziest day on earth, what do you still do to make sure that you, you know, stay well and keep yourself afloat? And this could include some supplements that you might take, but otherwise you can just say, I get well be by, you know, whatever it is that's really important to you. How I get well be is I, I bring acts of stillness into my life because whether that's mindfulness, meditation, or breath awareness, something to anchor me in the present moment. Because at that point, I could check in with my body to know what I need at that moment. If I need to rest, if I need to eat a certain food, if I need to take a certain supplement, uh, if I need more energy, I'll maybe have some adaptogens. So it's to me, I think the genesis of sustainable wellness is realizing what you need in the present moment. Um, so I think it's a little bit you know, out there, it's a little bit more, uh, less tangible. Take this thing, one thing, but it's, it's a state of presence. I think at that point you can make acts of radiant wellness. Cause if you're just like randomly shooting in the dark, it can be overwhelming. But if you're coming from a place of stillness, you are a lot more likely to make things that work for your body and actually are supporting radiant wellness. I love the idea of sort of having a check-in with yourself to mm -hmm. know of the various tools that you have in your tool belt, which ones you're actually going to use that day, because maybe not every day you need to be doing every single thing. Yeah. I always joke that today's wellness morning routine would take three hours if you actually did everything that everyone tells you to do. It's insane. Um, but even then, um, I like this idea of picking out the things that you can just feel because you're so in tune with yourself and your gut mm -hmm. are important for that morning or that day um, yeah. rather than just trying to do it all. And again, like we talked about with the supplements thing, maybe that turns into doing nothing because you fatigue yeah. the idea of, you know, doing a lot for yourself on the wellness side to the point yeah. where you're like, I don't want to do any more self-care. Leave me yes. alone. <laughs> Sometimes it's doing nothing and just wiping the slate clean and letting things refresh. Yeah. I like that. Well, wonderful. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, well, thank you for it was having me. a true pleasure and honor to meet you face to face, even if it's over the digital airwaves. <laughs> and um, I'll be so excited to help everybody get more information about supplements when this episode comes out. All right. Have a great day. You too.